I know uh, I brought you all in here under the guise of understanding innovation. I know you're expecting some great big story about a grand idea of how we can all be massively innovative. But I'm here to tell you, unfortunately, that the way in which most of us understand innovation is actually an illusion. So I am, in fact, Nina Collars, and uh, thank you. I'm honored and thrilled to be here tonight. And I've been studying innovation for about seven years now. And <clears throat> innovation is important, right? Uh, it's the 21st century, and the 21st century has given us some pretty massive challenges. We've got environmental degradation all around us. Inequality is going up. Biodiversity is going down. Refugee crises are amongst us. Our surveillance and our privacy are at risk. These are massive and extremely complex problems. It's not going to take simple changes. We need to get people to act in fundamentally different ways and pretty quickly. And that's why innovation is important. Now, I fell into innovation kind of a backward way. When I started my PhD, I thought I wanted to study robots and war. And so I figured robotic innovation, it was supposed to be changing the fundamental way in which warfare was done. And so I thought this would be a good thing to write my dissertation about. And when I started, I pretty much understood the innovation the way everybody else did. Innovation is top down. So innovation is really smart people who give us nice, shiny things. And then the whole world changes as a result, right? Innovation happens in that way. That's what, what I thought when I started my dissertation. And in order to study robots and warfare, I went to these technology conferences. And I started looking at all of the shiny robots. And I started interviewing all of the CEOs and the super smart people. And I started thinking about robots and warfare. I watched autonomous robots fly. I watched them play chess. I watched robots play soccer against each other. They have a yearly competition. And every time I watched, it seemed to me just something was a little wrong. Something didn't seem quite right about this innovative robotic stuff. And the one conference I went to, I was sitting down in the audience, <clears throat> and there was this comparison chart. And on the left was actually Big Dog, Boston Dynamics, four-legged war robot, and all of Big Dog's capabilities. And on the right was the picture of a donkey. The capabilities for Big Dog were listed. Okay? Big Dog is semi-autonomous to fully autonomous, which means you can load him up, and then he will follow you, and it's kind of creepy. But it's OK, right? This is innovation. Big Dog could carry in excess of 300 pounds, and he was super rugged. Big Dog could be kicked, and he would fall over, and he'd get back up. In fact, all of the internet videos featuring Big Dog, he's being kicked by scientists. He's probably the most kicked robot in the history of robotics. And then you could read about the donkey. Now, donkeys and mules were the way in which stuff was being transported throughout Afghanistan. Our soldiers were using them. And, and the, the details about the donkeys and mules were there. Carries about 150 pounds. And as it turns out, if you thought about it a little bit, donkeys were kind of semi-autonomous. I mean, they'd follow you, right? And it turns out, actually, if you take a donkey on a trail end to end enough times, it will learn to walk that trail all by itself. So the donkey was reasonably autonomous. And the donkeys and mules, I mean, I guess there aren't a whole lot of videos of people kicking donkeys and mules. I can't imagine it would work out well for the human. But, <laughs> but you know, one could say that donkeys and mules were reasonably rugged. And so it was, it was a very serious comparison chart. And there was just one problem at the bottom of the screen. It says. Big dog, powered by jet fuel. Donkey, powered by hay. And I wasn't sure which one was the innovation anymore. See, it seemed to me that the hay was the better idea. And I didn't know what to do about that. So I thought, OK, maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm just crazy. Like, maybe, 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 right? Everybody else thinks Big Dog's the better plan. So I lean back. I lean back because there's a couple Army officers, veteran Army officers sitting behind me. And I want to know what they think. What do you think? Donkeys or robots? And I lean back just in time to hear the one officer say to the other, my money is on the donkey. It was a problem. 
So from that day on, what I thought about innovation started to shift. I started to ask different questions. I stopped interviewing elites. I stopped interviewing geniuses. And I started talking to everyday soldiers. I stopped looking for shiny things, and I started looking for more donkeys. And what I found when I talked to the soldiers is that I asked them, hey, what worked and what didn't? And if it didn't work, how'd you fix it? And they would tell me all of these amazing stories of things they created, things that they used, the, things, the resources around them, they fixed the problems. Except not one of them talked about robots, not one of them. And in fact, when I finally forced somebody to talk about robots, they said they locked them up in a closet because they didn't work that well in the desert, sand, nothing quite worked right. So I thought, OK, I've got this. Innovation isn't quite what I think. A couple years later, I decided that I wanted to change my research. So I decided the biggest new problem on the planet was cybersecurity, right? The internet. And I started hearing, I started hearing people talk about solving the internet problem the same way they were talking about the robotics problem. What's government going to do? One big policy. What's technology going to do? One big technological solution. All I was hearing was top-down solutions. So I decided that I needed to interview people who did the work on the ground, information security providers, and eventually white hat hackers. Now, white hat hackers are different than black hat hackers. White hat hackers are, for all intents and purposes, the good guys. And I wanted to know how they did the work they did. And I started to think that that was what innovation is. See, I think this is what innovation looks like. It looks awful. It looks pretty ugly. And I think this is the way 21st century problems are going to get fixed, from the bottom up, not the top down. I think that innovation isn't about genius or shiny objects. I think it's actually pretty gritty. And as I interviewed both sets, seemingly entirely different sets of people, white hat hackers, and military soldiers, I found that innovation didn't seem like objects and smart people anymore. It seemed like a behavior. In fact, both communities started to seem to me to share the same set of behaviors. The first set of behavior that they tended to exhibit was that they didn't like being told exactly what to do. Hacker communities in particular are well known for this. They, they fundamentally challenge all the rules that are on the table. They're not going to let you get away with saying that you shouldn't do something just because you don't like it, that people are messing with it. And along these lines, I want to talk about some of the hackers that I've learned about, in particular, Kristen Padgett. Now, Kristen Padgett has a regular day job. She works for Google. She works for Microsoft. She is a professional breaker. They hire her, she goes in, she checks out their technology, and she shows them all the weaknesses they have at it. That's her day job. Also, she's probably the only person in the world whose professional job title is Hacker Princess. It's on her business card. It's when Kristen goes to bed at night, when she goes home, it's the, that's when her company starts to sweat a little bit. Because Kristen's a white hat hacker, and she doesn't want to be told what she can research and what she can't. She does her own work on the side. And in 2010, Kristen decided that she was worried about your cell phones and who might be listening. And so she put together about $1,500 of technology, readily available on the marketplace. And she decided to show the world that she could replicate, she could spoof a cell phone tower. And in doing so, she could listen to all of your phone conversations. Now, the phone companies weren't that interested in having her tell the world this, because it made all the consumers nervous. But that's Kristen's job. Kristen's a white hat hacker. She wants to challenge those rules. I had the distinct pleasure a couple months ago of watching two hackers reveal how they can break industrial light bulbs and how they can unlock all your electronic doors without ever having touched them. That makes companies nervous. But that's OK, because those white hat hackers are interested in increasing security by checking all those places the corporations are unwilling to look at. The second behavior is that everybody I study tends to fix their own problems. They're not complacent about their environment. They look around, they have the resources, and they decide they want to fix things. And in this case, I'll talk about my soldiers. 
And so in 2006, we had a roadside bomb problem. We'd had a series of roadside bomb problems. But in 2006, there was a specific roadside bomb problem, and it was a heat-detonated bomb. This means that when the vehicles drive down the road and the engine passes over that bomb, that heat sets that bomb off, and it blows up and disables the truck, and it kills the people inside the vehicle. Now, the Department of Defense knew that this was a problem, and they were working on a solution. And to, in their best defense, they, it took them about six to eight months to create a solution, which is fast for the DOD. But eight months is a long time if you're the person driving that truck. So the soldiers took it in their own hands. And what they found out was if you take a long steel pole and you weld it to the front of your truck and then you put something real hot way out there, like a toaster or maybe a little bit of a metal box and you put some glow plugs in there and you wire it back to the engine of your vehicle, you could create a real hot box and you could drive down the road and that hot box would set off those bombs before it got underneath your vehicle. It would save those people's lives. The people I study tend to fix their own problems. The final thing that I think makes these innovators unique, the kind of behavior they exhibit, is something you'll never see top-down innovations do, is they share their failures. The only thing you ever see when you look at the shiny new stuff are the successes. They're not going to show you the failures, and they're certainly not going to share them with you. And so I return in this case to the story of Kristen Paget. I had the pleasure of watching her give a presentation about her latest work. Kristen's worried about your credit cards. See, it turns out your new credit cards have RFID chips, radio frequency identifiers in them. So those RFID chips send out your credit card data. And she showed us a couple months ago that she didn't have to reach into your pocket to steal your credit card information. She just had to get close enough to you. So Krista reveals this to the audience, and she goes, I've been working on a solution. Remember, this is not what she gets paid for. This is what she does in her spare time. I've created a solution, she says. I'm going to take this thing, and she calls it the guard bunny, because it has big red eyes. And she puts the guard bunny on top of the credit card. And when she does that, it prevents that data from being stolen. She tells us how she made the guard bunny. She gives us all of the blueprints tells us where to buy the parts to build our own guard bunny. And then she says, it doesn't work perfectly yet. And so I'm giving all of you the instructions on how to build your own. And I beg of you to go home and make it better. See, it turns out that these communities, both the military and the hacker communities, they like to learn. And learning only happens when you fail. When you're successful, you only know the one way. But when you fail, you know that there can be multiple ways you've got to try out. And those communities, they cling to their failures, and they share them with each other, and they teach each other so that everybody can work on the problem at the same time. All these little problem solvers all over the place, adapting, they're challenging the rules, they're fixing their own problems, and then they're sharing stuff. Innovation, as I see it, isn't top-down. It's not just for smart people, and you don't need to wait for it. Innovation is a behavior, and that's really good news, because we have some huge problems coming, and if innovation isn't about one smart person somewhere to give us the one shiny thing, and if it is a behavior, then this is about you, that you need to challenge, you need to fix something, you need to share your failures. You don't have to be smart. You don't have to have a ton of money. You just have to start to want to do something near yourself. You're wondering why I'm showing you a flock of birds. <laughs> this is called a murmuration. These are actually starling birds, and they're flying around in a flock. And if you're watching from afar, scientists early thought, oh, how do these birds create this beautiful pattern? How do they change so rapidly? How do they innovate? How do they flip and turn and come together? And they thought, those birds must have telepathy. They must be able to read each other's minds. No such luck. As it turns out, to produce beautiful patterns like this, each of those birds only has to follow three simple rules. Want to be near other birds. Don't crash into other bird. Go roughly in the same general direction of the other bird. 
If the bird follows those three simple rules, that's the kind of change you're looking at. That kind of rapid, swirling, amazing pattern. People thought it was a top-down solution. People thought it was a centralized solution. It's distributed, and it's beautiful. Innovation is bottom-up. Thank you.